Well, with the UK energy cap going up 10% this week, it's episode four of the Carbon Chronicles with Latimer Alder. Latimer, tell me, what's happening in the world of climate? Well, yeah, so wind power. A lot of people tell me wind power is the way of the future. It's new technology. It's high tech. It is the thing that's going to save the world. And I fear they don't actually know much his technology history. So today we just have a very short, technology history lesson about where what wind was and where it came from as a power source um there's a very good proverb that says those who don't learn from history are destined to repeat it and i fear that without understanding a bit of history we're repeating the same mistakes or the same problems that that people had over the past two or three thousand years let's start by going back to this time and this is a reconstruction a picture of a reconstruction of an old greek galley you know what greek galleys used to look like because we found a few buried or sunk at the bottom of the mediterranean sea and these these were basically warships greek galleys for beating up other greek galleys as far as i can understand and they were powered by two two things one they had a sail here which is great you can see the sail is attached to the mast lots of strong ropes holding it down and if the wind is ahead of uh, behind you you can do some nice sailing what you can't do is any sailing against the wind of course it's a bit like if you know do any sailing now this is a bit like a spinning but notice along here all these things called oars and beneath the decks there were tens or twenties or fifties of galley slaves sitting here to assist the wind or to back up the wind when it wasn't blowing Nasty job being a galley slave. I'm very glad I wasn't one. I think it would be backbreaking and, and terrible. Maybe even, you were in a previous life. Say again? Maybe you were in a previous oh, life. Oh, in which case then, I, yeah, perhaps I was actually. This is just karma. You've now been sent back to try and educate people for your previous woes. I'm, I'm sure I was a Greek prince or whatever the equivalent of Greek princes were in, in those days. Yeah, so okay. You the guys on the top <laughs> back in the drum, but not so much nice if you're and the guys at the bottom pulling the oars. So that was the first use of things. And, you know, we, to an extent, that's been very useful. People believe that, the, you know, the South Sea Islands in the Pacific were populated by people who got on boats that drifted, uh, were blown along by the wind to get to where they wanted. Maybe that was true. But, 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 and we'll come to but, but, but in a minute. And on land, we invented windmills. This would, windmills were invented, we think, about the 12th century, so maybe about the year 1100. And this is a picture of one, and the picture comes from 1340. Okay. And a windmill is a very simple, it's a little more complicated than a ship with a sail at, that will only go into the wind. But what it has fundamentally, like all wind power, it has wind vanes of some description, these things here. The wind turns that pushes the veins the veins turn a shaft and the shaft running here you can see it running through the top here yep. and at the bottom of, and the shaft then somehow we do some work in this case probably this we can see the man here coming and he's going to mill some flour so he's got millstones attached it could be uh he attaches a pump a water pump and mm -hmm. if, if the, the quotes windmills of holland well they were water pumps they weren't there for milling corn they were there to keep keep the Netherlands dry once they yeah. built the dikes and the polders. And, and, and. And the essential thing here is that you've got a turning shaft driven by the wind. And by the turning shaft, using the turning shaft, we can do some work, whatever that work may be. Yeah, simple. Mm -hmm. Yep. And this, this goes back to the, as I say, the 12th century, about 1100 something. It was invented, we think, down in mesopotamia in in uh, in the middle east okay but there is a fundamental problem with wind and it's the fundamental problem for the greek galleys as well as the fundamental problem for the windmills that they had uh, in in the middle middle ages and that is that the wind itself is variable and fickle just and like women <laughs> well, I'll, 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 i think we'll park that one <laughs> The this is a plot of the UK wind fleet's output of electricity last month. 
And here we are today is, I think, the 2nd of October. So this is pretty much up to date. And we have a big, the, I think, the second biggest fleet of wind power in the world after China. And we, and we can measure how, how it's doing quite well. And we do this in, in almost real time. And over the month, this, re, this blue line represents how much power the fickle wind is giving us. And you can see that at some points, it was giving us a lot of power it was up towards the top of this graph. Don't worry about what these units are at the moment. The point I want to illustrate is the variability. But at other points, and very soon afterwards, within less than a day, perhaps, you've gone from an awful lot of power to very little power. Very little power here, and very little power here, and very little power there, and very little power there. And down here, we can see what the limits of the power that we got during September last year is. And the average was six of these units. The maximum was 14, so more than twice the average. And the minimum was about one half. So that's about a twelfth of the average. Mm -hmm. So overall, the variability of this stuff goes from 0 0.555 to 14.27, which is nearly 30 times the variability. And it is totally out with our control. It happens because the wind blows or the wind doesn't blow. There's nothing we yeah. we in the UK can do to control this. We can't. We could pray to the wind gods, but I don't imagine that would be very successful. We could sacrifice a goat. We could sacrifice, I don't know, our firstborn. We could do all sorts of silly things, but that's the way the wind is. And the wind's been like that for 3,000 years, and it's not going to change. And that is the fundamental problem with all wind power and hasn't changed in that time. Okay. Now, so what happened 200 years ago was a new technology came along. And here's an illustration of the new technology. The new technology is the steam engine. The steam engine here, I've chosen to put it in a, 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 a mobile form. This was Stevenson's rocket or replica of Stevenson's rocket in, in the National Railway Museum in York. And suddenly you had power that was controllable. You could put this thing on some railway lines and you could regulate its speed to how much you chose to do using coal in the bit here and water. And we could put those in ships as well. Mm -hmm. Here is a great painting that I'm sure you've seen before, but anybody who hasn't, you can go and see it in the National Gallery in Trafalgar Square. It's called The Fighting Temeraire by Turner. And what he shows here, not from one of his sunsets, he, he liked sunsets, is a real ship. This was The Fighting Temeraire. It was, it was by now, in 1838, it was 40 years old. It had been built in Chatham. It had seen active service in the Royal Navy. And it was towed up the Thames by a steam tug. See the steam tug with its yep. black funnel and the thing coming out? To be broken up. That was the end of the fighting Temeraire, the name of it. And clearly this is in many ways a prophetic picture. But what it was saying is, look, the days of steam, one of the things it was saying, among others, the days of steam are over, uh, the days of sail, sailing ships are over, and the days of steam have come. And that was nearly 200 years ago. The that's sunset a, of sail. The suns. Well, that's another way of putting it. Very, very good, John. Yes, I hadn't thought of that, but you're absolutely right. Of course, sunset of sail, going into the sunset, and that was really it. From about 1838, 1840, there were very few sailing ships, brand new sailing ships built. I, mean, I think the last one I know of was the Cutty Sark, mm -hmm. which was a famous Cutty Sark, and I think that went out of service nearly a nearly a hundred years later. But more than 100 years ago, since, since the Cutty Sark was withdrawn. So we don't do sailing ships anymore for commercial or military purposes. We do steam or diesel or other, other similar things. That's because it is better and we can control it. Now, somebody who didn't understand all this stuff took, in, pardon me, took into their head that what we needed to do now was to use these things. Yeah. And Things have been re they are windmills. They do exactly the same as I said windmills did before. They've got vanes that turn a shaft, and we use the shaft to do some work. In this yeah. case, the work is making electricity. The principles remain the same, exactly the same principle as the windmill of the 12th century. They 
cool. Yeah, but, it? but the concepts, the concepts, not that outlandish because you're getting you're getting power from you know stuff that's there anyway, aren't you? So, is he other than the cost of materials? Is it effectively free power? Well, let's have, we'll have a look at that a little bit later on. Is it free? Well, other than the cost of materials and having to put them up and maintain yeah. them, and so, but you might as well say, well, the cost of a coal, uh, coal is apart from the the fact you need to build a a steam engine and look after it and so forth. You could you could dig the coal out the ground at almost no cost if you're lucky. Open cast mine; it doesn't cost very much at all. Being free. It's not necessarily what you want. So these things have the same basic technology as windmills and the mm -hmm. same basic problem. And you go back to this, and that's yeah. that's the technology that we were seeing. Same basic. Don't, and I don't know if you've got it, but Mr. Balaban come up with an idea today that is going to going to fix that variability. Have right. you have you got that into this slideshow? I've got a slide on it, but I'm happy to talk about it. Mr. Mi Mr. Milliband wants to talk about using bloody great flywheels, yes? Yeah, he does, yeah. He wants to build giant metal flywheels. Obviously, they're going to be heavy, I would think. And they he's going to power be. them up, yeah? yeah? Keep them spinning. And yeah. then... Yeah. And then mm -hmm. when, the, when the wind drops, he'll just, they'll tap into that and as the wheel runs down, it will produce electricity until it can't effectively do it anymore. And then you'll have to switch it back over to spinning it back up. Yeah. Yeah. Like all the, so it's just another way of making some form of energy storage. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. There's nothing magical about that. No. A bicycle works that way. <laughs> when you get a bike moving, it, it keeps going because the wheels keep going around. That's, it's as simple as that. Yeah. So is it feasible? Is it feasible? In a physics textbook, it's feasible. Whether it's feasible in actual real terms that you could get big enough, enough big enough flywheels in the country, all working the same time in the right place, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I don't know. I, I my, my gut feel says, even if you could do it, it seems a remarkably big sledgehammer to crack a nut, really. <sighs> Worries me is the, these things, wind turbines, aren't terribly efficient. They're round about 45% or something, aren't they? I'm, I'm more worried about what comes out the back than what goes in the in the. Yeah, front. yeah, okay, but if they're about 45% efficient and you're using that to then spin up a flywheel, yeah. oh, which yeah. you're then going to lose more efficiency, oh, and then yeah. you're going to have to tap into the flywheel when the wind's not blowing, so you're going to yeah. lose... I mean, how much how much energy are you actually going to have left? But don't know the answer to that question. But you you have you've discovered what we call the laws of thermodynamics, and, and I think in, yeah. in the chat I've talked about, you know, there is no such thing as a free lunch. <laughs> Somewhere you have to pay, and there's a, a a thing called entropy that comes into it as well. And entropy is always there. Entropy is always increasing, and you're always paying the entropy cost or something. So yeah, whatever you do, you're you're reducing the amount of available energy. And if one of these flywheel things broke apart, I've got a feeling it might um, might do quite a lot of damage as well. Well, wind turbines do when they fall apart, because oh. I mean, and they do occasionally. It has happened. Now, if you're in the middle of the sea, maybe that doesn't matter so much. But Yeah, but we've got quite a few over land as well, and yeah. quite near yeah. houses. Oh, we're going to have more, and they're going to be bigger. They're going to be the size of... I think I saw someone going to be the size of the Shard in London, which I think is still, yeah, that's massive. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's still still I think the, the tallest building in in London uh, in in Britain, and whether it's the tallest in Europe or not, I don't know. Uh, a wind turbine that size is going to make a hell of a lot of noise as well. Yeah, yeah but but you know, it's, it, yeah, <laughs> all these things are true. Apart from when it's not going round, and, and that yeah. there will be no wind when it's doing nothing at all. And, and that is, to my mind, the, the fundamental disadvantage is that you can't control it. You, don't, you cannot dial it up and say, now we need more, give me more, or now we don't need so much, give me less. Weird, isn't it? Mm. So that's where the UK is heading. That's where the, quote, developed nations say they are heading is towards wind power. But let's have a look at how much wind power is really being used. It's, it's great for people to talk about the renewables revolution. But here I've taken the entire 
energy used in the world in the whole world and this is plotted over 25 years from 1992 okay. and each of the different colored bands represents one source of energy so down here we've got coal still increasing despite what everybody says we've got oil obviously very popular for transport and heating and 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 we got natural gas which we use a lot of um particularly for heating got nuclear making a bit we got hydropower which well, hydropower is a, is a great source of energy mm -hmm. if you happen to have the geography to make it happen above that you have wind and solar and modern biofuels which are what we call the renewables revolution and i put a big circle around it so you can see it so you don't miss it because that is the renewables revolution that people keep talking about. It's yeah. that size in, in the global context. It's not 50% of the world's energy coming from renewables or whatever it might be. And note one thing here. This is total energy that we use. Mm -hmm. People exaggerate the renewables because they only often only talk about electricity. Really yeah. electricity. Electricity is because that is all renewables can make. They solar and wind can only make electricity. They can't do any anything else. You can't burn solar or you can't burn wind to uh, to um, make your car go. As yeah, but you can you can use electricity as a heat source. You can use your yeah, but 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 what I'm saying is it's not a big use. Yeah, and roughly about between a sixth and a fifth and a sixth of the world's total energy comes via electricity. I mean, four-fifths and five-sixths, 80% to 84%, comes from this other stuff. So even if it was 50% of electricity, that yeah. would still make it only a tenth or a twelfth or a fifteenth or whatever of the total energy used. As you can see it there. It's mm -hmm. still there, but it's not big. Yeah? And I just thought, show this, I found this today. Oh, this is God. a wonderful picture. This is Ed Miliband, our energy secretary, and he has got a blue ukulele for reasons that escape me. And he is standing in front of a wind farm. He is singing Blowing in the Wind, the famous, he's in fact, he's singing very badly Blowing in the Wind, the famous number by Bob Dylan and yep. probably Joan Baez as well, I should think. You might think I am being an evil, nasty person by perhaps taking a, a gentle dig at Mr. Miliband. But this is taken from his own promotional video. Yeah, yeah, he, I know. Mr. Miliband <laughs> is, is a wind fan, and here he is saving his windmills. Some might say he indeed is a bag of wind himself. Yeah, yeah some might, might they not? Though he doesn't actually talk a lot. He's not you know, overknown for his lengthy speeches. He's no. Just, he's just, he's a zealot. I think that's the best we can say of him. Yeah, fair enough. So this is this is this kind of epitomizes Mr. Miliband's thing that, that windmills are windmills, or if he wants to call them wind turbines, call them what you like. They're the same stuff. Are his chosen way of the future, given all the disadvantages and all the things that that told us these things were effectively got rid of two hundred years ago? Yeah, because they weren't reliable. So or, they're, no, they're, actually, not because they're not reliable, but because the wind's not reliable. Exactly. If if we had constant controllable winds, then yeah, I'm I'm up for it, mate. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. But um, I was in the south of France last week, week before last, uh, cycling, and they have a wind called the Mistral, and for five days, the Mistral would have made a wonderful source of wind power. Yeah, is it fairly constantly and twenty four hours by seven, twenty four hours a day? But when it stopped, it stopped, and it was had gone completely for the last three days of my visit. So yeah, I, as, as you know, I lived in France um, yeah. for a little while, and um, we we lived there um, most of the time. We spent in uh, southwest France, which is the maritime side of it. Okay, and. Uh, it's it's quite inland. It was very very flat. So you think it would be ideal for wind turbines, and they did have quite a lot of wind turbines. But mm. most of the time they're stationary because, to be fair, the wind doesn't blow that much in France. <laughs> that well, that that is kind of a bit of a 
bit of a fundamental difficulty, isn't it, really? Yeah, yeah. Most of the time, I mean, you drive past you drive past these wind turbines and they'd all be stationary. And and when I say stationary, I mean stationary for weeks on on end. Yep. Um, just as well that France has got so many nuclear power stations, perhaps. Indeed. Indeed it is. And that's why so much uh, of France's electricity comes from nuclear, because it's got a lot of it. Yeah. For them, perhaps we would have been wiser to follow their lead rather than to try and do what we did. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I, d- I did note on the, the week that um, Britain closed its last coal-fired power station, which... Yep. and and. I'm led to believe they're actually decommissioning it, so it's not as if they're going to be able to fire up in an emergency. That's a good idea, wasn't it? Uh, so as we close our last coal-fired power station, can I just point out that China currently, <laughs> and I found this quite astounding, China currently has 3,092 coal-fired power stations. A lot. I didn't know it was 3,092. And it's built... <laughs> One a week, yeah. It built 43 in 2000 and, um 23 and i think it's it's on course to beat that this year and it, it's very strange when you come to talk about china if you point out that the fact they're still very heavily reliant on coal people start saying but they've got a lot of wind turbines they've got more wind turbines than we have that yeah. may be the case but it's not relevant to the amount of coal they use yeah but china's also massive compared to us like saying i i, I don't drink on sundays look how good i am and then you go, yeah, but you're drinking twice as much on Mondays, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays. So it doesn't make a difference. Yeah. If you want to signal your virtue of using renewable energy, you have to get rid of the other stuff. You have to get rid of the coal and the oil and the gas for it to matter. Just saying, I've done more of that makes no difference. It's like an indulgence, you know? It's all gone a bit wrong for Germany as well, since they shut down the other nuclear power stations and the. Well, in, the, in deep trouble. Yeah. Germany economy is certainly its car industry and all that is just. I think Volkswagen is shutting down car plants. Two plants, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's a stake. That's a, a dagger to the heart of the German economy. But when mm-hmm. its own flagship Volkswagen starts pulling away, wow. Yeah, and, uh, and BASF. Germany's largest chemical manufacturer yeah. and world renowned um, yeah, well, has m- moved to China. Yeah, well, crikey, 40, 50 years ago, we used to use BS, BSF product when I was working in a chemistry lab. In, uh, yeah. It was a gap year job. Yeah, absolutely. So, I'll just move on to the last couple of charts that I prepared. Yep, John, me... yep absolutely. So I thought this one has caused great amusement. Um, and it's something about. Some figures released this week where the, the idea is people say this is fantastic new technology, whereas where we're going to make floating wind farms, we're not going to tether them to the seabed like in the picture I showed you. We're going to put a, a windmill on a raft. Oh, good God. Throw it to the middle of the sea. This is this is a recipe for disaster. And and let it make the, uh, get, get the wind that way. And people think this is absolutely new and high tech. First thing to say is, Hang on a minute. We've had rafts since before the the Greek galley I showed you. Yeah, yeah. A bit, bit of wood floating. And we've had windmills since 12, 1100, 1200. So sticking a windmill from 1200 on a raft from the Stone Age does not look like total brand new leading edge technology to me. Now, admittedly, you might have to do a little bit of teething problems to make sure how to do it the best way, but there's nothing new at all in this it's just adaptations of existing technology okay right now king cardin is a test bed mm. for uh, this floating technology and last week uh, monday i think it was it re- released its annual results for last year 2003 and our good friend andrew montford bishop hill from uh one of the Two, things, 2023 did, did I say 2003? My apologies. To pr- produce this analysis of their results. He's in the chart okay. of the count, so he knows how to do these things. Quick. And this is the thing we need to look at, we want to look at. Their cost of sales, that's how much, this is operational costs. Mm-hmm. How much it costs to make all the electricity it 
produced six million pounds from the expenditure side, and the income from selling it, the sales, was thirteen million pounds. Okay. Oh, so we we make it for forty six million and sell it for thirteen million. Okay, it's just under four times lower. Just under four times, or a loss of. Uh, quickly in my head, that's uh, thirty-three million pounds. Oh dear! Oh. How, how, how did we pay for that? Oh look, they got a subsidy, and a subsidy is real money. Subsidies, oh. renewables are real money. That is, we the taxpayers give you the wind farm promoters real cash. The thirty-one million pounds that right. you used. Right. Okay. Taxpayers. Okay, before before we get, we get called out for obfuscating things, is this the first year of this working? No, this is the third year of it working. Oh, right, okay. Because um, I was going to suggest maybe it gets better, you know, yeah. kind of, you know as it keeps running. No, I haven't put it in the, in the presentation. In fact, it's getting worse. That the oh lot is getting bigger with experience, not smaller. So how... How is this financially viable? Because you've got other costs there that take it well over what they're bringing in. Well, all that happens is the debt owed by the company that runs it is increasing. It's now got up to a total of £70 million. And what's their strategy for increasing their sales? <laughs> whistling for the wind. <laughs> I think they're either whistling for the wind or they are going to sacrifice their firstborn, as I suggested earlier. They don't have a strategy. They're sitting there, fat, dumb, and happy, pretty damn sure that the, if they do go back, the government will bail them out. But I want to make just one other point here. And I think I said subsidy, this £31 million. Pounds, yeah. Real money going from the taxpayer to the wind farm. So the wind farm man can go and spend that money. He can use that to pay for the people he needed to employ to make the sales or the people who's needed to come and maintain his windmills or whatever it is. That's real cash. So, People so you know, you know how they say, you know, a wind turbine will pay for itself over like twenty years or something like that. Um, how's this ever going to pay for itself? It's not, and it's the test bed for this new technology that's going to take over the world. So it's too expensive to use. Well, I think the te what the te the test bed is doing the experiment is is proving that it's a financial disaster. Yeah, yeah. and. Uh, and um, I, d I don't know if you've seen the solar rafts, you know, the um, the one in India and the one in Nebraska? Yes, and um, very unhappily, this uh, solar raft, the biggest solar farm in the world, was uh, totally destroyed by a hailstorm, if I remember correctly. Yeah, that was the one in Nebraska, I think. But there was a solar raft in India that was completely broken up um, okay. because, of, because um, they had some really bad weather. Really? And all the solar panels were destroyed because they were on rafts and they all got smashed up against each other. Oh, dear. funny that. Do you think rafts being smashed up against each other has ever happened before in the history of the maritime world? Yeah, I think it has. Yeah. yeah. You, you might think these people would have thought of that, wouldn't you? Perhaps they yeah. should have learned some history like we've been trying to. Yeah. yeah. I mean, sometimes I despair at the sheer naivety of these people that, that they don't even bother to learn from engineering experience. Anyway, can I just finish one last point? Yeah. This thing called tax credit and subsidy. People try often to confuse the difference between a subsidy, which is real cash given to somebody, and a tax credit, which is money not taken from them. It's a different thing. So okay. Subsidy is I pay you and give you the money you can spend. So that's it. like a grant. There's a grant, you can have that money and you don't need to pay it back it's and there's no interest money. on it. It's Pop, just a... Pocket money from your dad. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. A tax credit is your dad not confiscating your pocket money. Okay, yep. Different thing. No money changes hands in a tax credit. Yeah. Yeah. All that is is saying we won't charge you £6 million worth of tax. Yep. That, and you, know, you can do that for all sorts of reasons. There's a, there's a good argument about tax credits that say... If you if you were walking down the street and you had two hundred pounds in your pocket, and a mugger came up and stole hundred and eighty, but left you twenty quid for a taxi fare home, 
in some definitions, that mugger would be very generously subsidising you by 20 quid. Yeah, okay. Yeah, all, ta- <laughs> all taxes theft. Yeah, I've got you. I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. <laughs> But yes, effectively it is. Yeah, well, it is, yeah. I'm 100% behind you on that one, yeah. All, all tax is theft. I mean, what was it? Income tax was originally brought in to pay for the Napoleonic Wars. And and they actually did repeal it for about a year and then realised, what are we doing? We've got a great money spinner here. So they brought it back in. But the whole point I'm, gonna, I'm trying to make again about this is tax credit is money not changing hands. Yeah. Yeah, subsidy is money actually changes hands from one person to another. Yeah, tax okay. credit says we're not going to tax you on this bit. Okay. Yeah, yeah, it's like when the government cut the cost of that. We're not going to steal this amount of money off you. That's for exactly. the for the next year. Exactly. Yeah. So, so you cannot it is, you cannot as a business spend that tax credit. You can't go and pay a supplier with it. You can't go for a Christmas party. It's just a, we didn't steal it from you. So it's they're qualitatively different. Yeah, okay. So when you see, particularly in The Guardian, you know, fossil fuel companies get mm, 10, million, 10 billion times yeah. more support than they, what they're talking about support is they didn't get taxed on something that perhaps people think they could have been. Okay. But it's not that they got paid real yeah. money. Yeah, yeah, they didn't get subsidies. Yeah. Important to, to, to understand that. Okay. Right, and my last chart says, so wind power, what have we seen? 200 years ago, it was obsolete. Steam engine overtook both on land and on sea the um, the sail powers and the windmill power. The wind has not changed. There's nothing different about the wind now from the wind 1,000 years ago or 5,000 years ago or five. 500,000 years ago. It's still fickle. It still blows when it chooses to. Okay, I'll give you that. The technology, basic technology hasn't changed. It might be better. It's more efficient. Efficiencies have been gained. We might make better windmills. We might use better materials. They might be lighter weight. They might be bigger. All those things might be true. But the fundamental thing that you rely on the fickle wind to make the things go round is unchanged, and that's never going to change. And actually, thinking about it, and I hadn't really thought about it, is, yes, technology has improved the process, but at the expense of using more technology, like, you know, carbon fiber blades and high high, high efficiency gearboxes that are full of oil of some kind, you know, and you've got to make the oil to lubricate the gearboxes. And, and then I, I remembered about um, Scottish Power. And because our national grid infrastructure is actually so bad, they actually have diesel generators on site to keep the wind turbines spinning in the winter so as yeah. the gearboxes don't freeze up when the wind's not blowing. So I understand, yeah. Yeah, um, that yeah. was an eye-opener. That was an eye-opener. And, and you're right, John. I mean, we pr- we make better windmills than we did 800 years ago, but they're still windmills. Yeah, yeah, they and are. That's the key point. The t- when I say the technology's not changed, there is no fundamental difference. Yeah, well, we, we made solar panels in the late 1800s, and fundamentally the technology's not changed. You know, I mean, there was they were about... They weren't great. They were about 12% efficient, and the modern one's about 30%. But yeah. you know that's not that's not a great improvement. Well, it's better better than nothing. And, yeah. and eighteen fifty seven, we invented the heat pump, and that's nearly nearly two hundred years old as well. Mm-hmm. And the point I was going to make here is, we know the failings of wind power because they're very apparent from what we've seen. But what we're trying to do now with net zero and all that is do immense contortions to cover up its failures. You talked about these huge, great flywheel things. Yeah. Yeah. Is anyone yeah. using them? Do you know anything about them, though? I, I mean, know. The, the, pr- the principle is it's a gyroscope. It's a bloody great job. I mean, big flywheel. Well, yeah. I, I'm, big I, I, flywheel I, I, to stabilise things we've had for years. We've never had one. Well, you got years. one in your car, you know. I mean, I can understand. I can understand the principle, but I just wonder if anyone's actually using anything like this to try well, and smooth out their power delivery. 
to to an extent, the old gas fired generators do effectively have a flywheel within them, and it's taken if you take them out and the the big coal fired part because the generators themselves were the were the flywheels. Yeah, right. Okay. Taking those out of service, you've now got to put it put though put that characteristic back into your grid by building something on the external side. And you're doing uh, these, uh, just an example of these what I call immense contortions. So. My, the net of all my presentation is learn from history. And if you do, you wouldn't have embarked on this thing in a million years. But we have. Uh, yeah, yeah, we have. And I, I I don't think the bottom line's any different from last week in that yeah. it seems to be that the government is waiting on a magic bullet coming from somewhere. That's, you know, some new technology or some breakthrough in science that's going to solve all these issues. Oh, just sorry. I'm just looking out my window here, John. I think I saw the flashing lights of a flying pig going into Heathrow. <laughs> just, uh, oh. I, I, I fear, I fear for the technological nous of these people. It, it is not good enough that people can say, "Well, I read PPE, Philosophy, Politics, and Economics at at Oxford," which I think is what Mr. Miliband did. Or that I read law, which is what Mr. Starmer did. Or that I read classics. I mean, if you read Mr. Johnson, read classics uh, years before. Uh, Mr. Sunak, I can't remember now. But all the political leaders are dealing with technology, which they don't begin to understand. Yeah, I mean, yeah. The, the, the last two people in government who had any form of scientific knowledge, really was uh, Lord Lilly, Peter Lilly, who was the, I think he got to a, a ministerial office before. And before that was Mrs. Thatcher. And she was a chemist, and chemistry, yeah. you do a lot of thermodynamics. Going before that, they've, they've got no no knowledge of this stuff. And yet it's freely available. You know, the history of these technologies is not a secret. It's not you know, hidden away in the Bank of England or something. We've written only under lock and key. You can... Go down any popular science bit or popular history bit and read about the history of wind power or railways or steamships or whatever. And and yet they never do. Or if they do, they try to think this time it's all different. But sadly, it isn't. Yeah, it certainly isn't. Hmm. Well, thanks for tuning us up again, like <laughs> ah, on that bombshell, <laughs> Mr. Clarkson. <laughs> It's not cheering you up. It's bringing you bringing you back from fairyland to reality. Yeah, I don't think I've ever been in fairyland, unfortunately. I think you'd look lovely in it too. too. <laughs> I thank you, um, and, and I think um, with that, that's uh, that that brings the conversation quite quite rightly to a close. To the end of the road tonight. Unveil the truth, not out of sight Net zero plans, they clash and fight Agenda dreams in dimming light Energy falls like grains of sand Policies drawn by an unseen hand Crying out in this troubled land Questioning where we stand The power fades, the questions grow In the shadows, truths will show Voices strong, they overflow A future built on what we 